who is the most iconic villain in sci-fi movie history? If you said Darth Vader, I would have to agree with you. And so when I found out my friend Demetrius was one of the three people to play this once in a lifetime role, I had to catch up with them and find out his attitude, his mindset, and his will and determination to be the one selected to play the return of this character. Our experience on Age of Revelation, I mean, if, if I didn't get a chance to tell you, because, you know, everything happened so fast. We were shooting mm -hmm. not that many days together, but you were such a pro, man. I was so lucky to have you. I was so fortunate. I made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> I bought that heavy chainmail armor yeah, yeah. and you didn't complain. You did not complain, but that chainmail armor was like, what, 30 to 50 pounds or something? Like 50 pounds. Yeah, yeah. We ended up cutting it a little bit because it restricted the movement that went almost to my knees, I think. And I I mean, I do a lot of suit stuff, but I've never done fight choreo and chain mail. Yeah. And me meanwhile, you're like throwing kicks and punches. Like you, you didn't complain like at all. I would be like, I'm hot. I'm sweaty. I'm under a mask. I cannot breathe. I'm wearing all this armor. Five minutes, 10 minutes is the pain tolerance, but you did probably like two to three hours or something like that. I'm, I'm a suit actor and we sign a contract when we enter this world that you have to have an extreme pain threshold and you have to know some form of meditation or some form of calming mm -hmm. yourself down and being okay when you're not okay. You have yeah. to accept that from the beginning. Like this is a contract an unspoken contract that you know going in that it's gonna kind of suck a little bit then from there you just find the things that help you do good if you focus on being hot or being uncomfortable or being heavy or being tired it's a negative spiral and it will take you in a bad place so the main thing is to focus on having fun i get to do fight choreo i get to fight somebody my friends are here i'm learning so that's where your mind has to stay for me to make it an enjoyable process i think it's very rare to find someone like you especially at your size and build. I think people think, oh, you know, six, eight, I can find somebody else, but it's a different level. And I think you know, that's something that I wanted to talk about. How hard you train, for example. Like I always see you posting up some new movement that most regular people can't do. <laughs> Where does this come from? I started training circus when I was 23. When I moved to LA, I was already an adult. Before that, I had zero athletic training. And then at 21, I started training gymnastics at a gymnastics gym. And I was I'm mostly self-taught because I was a gymnastics coach. And I taught the kids, but I felt like a hypocrite. So I would train myself at night, the lesson plan that I'd make the kids do. But I would do it six days a week. And I wasn't a gymnast or an acrobat as a child. I was non-athletic. And then once I started getting good and I started breakdancing, I was part of a crew and I was doing theater locally. And I was trying to find a professional that fused movement, which I really loved, and theater. And both of those things were things that I didn't think I'd be capable of doing when I was like a kid. It wasn't something in my realm of possibility. I wasn't surrounded by cinema or anything like that. And that living, in my mind, was stunt work. So when I turned 23, my brother and I both moved to Los Angeles. He was going to be a screenwriter, and I was going to do stunt work. And then we got recruited at a Starbucks from a director of a circus school, like our third week in Los Angeles, where she literally tapped us on the shoulder of Stephanie Abrams. She said, oh, you're big, and you have a, you know, you have a good size, and we we need men for a circus. Have you ever thought of being a circus performer? It was a very odd experience for me because I wasn't used to someone coming like cold approaching me and, you know, be like, hey, join the circus. So she gave me her card and I didn't do anything with it. I just sat with it in my wallet for three weeks. But I was training in Santa Monica, practicing my breakdancing stuff, flipping a little bit, doing the things that I like to do in the beach. And I met these two girls at the beach who were circus performers. And we started doing handstands. And at the time, I could do a handstand for like 25 seconds with terrible form. And I met these two girls and they were like, oh, you know, we're training hand balancing at the circus school. We have a teacher and he's actually teaching us technique. There's a whole bunch of stuff you're supposed to do that you're not doing. You, I mean, they didn't say it that way, but they kind of explained what hand balancing was. And I was super excited because I haven't had a teacher and I wanted someone to guide me. So they're like, oh, I think I have a card somewhere in my purse. And they pull out and it's the same card. And they gave me that card and I pulled out the other card in my wallet and I have these two cards. And I'm like, it's destiny. And I called the next day and I was like, yeah, I'd like to try. And Stephanie was very kind because at the time I was super broad. Like I came to LA with nothing, nothing. I came with $600. And that was like my first month's rent. I had one job lined up coaching gymnastics. I didn't know a single person outside of my brother who was doing a study abroad program at LAFSC. And then I had a job coaching gymnastics. And then from there, I just wandered around asking random people like, hey, do you know how to get into stunt work? And then eventually I met a person who knew a person who had seen a stunt person train somewhere and they're like, you should try this gym. And then I started training at that gym and started meeting people and like, you should try this gym. I immediately called Stephanie and she allowed me to train at her circus school for free just to try stuff out. This is Los Angeles. You don't get anything for free. I trained and I tried a bunch of different disciplines. I tried trapeze and, and rope 
and clown. And I fell in love with hand balancing. And I fell in love with acrobatics. It was the closest thing to break dancing. In exchange, I was teaching recreational classes. And then I was also the janitor of the circus school. I would show up earlier and I'd clean the place and vacuum everything. And then in exchange for that, I would train for free. And I trained there for a year and a half with my brother. And that was our introduction to circus. Wow. You like literally did the dishes at the restaurant to pay yeah. your bills. But we struggled a lot because we weren't making much. He was working in the office. I was teaching a few classes. Mm -hmm. You know, and our, we, our day was at the circus school like 12 hours a day because we would, we would yeah. open, we would lock up. And at the time, I didn't even have a car. We shared a scooter that we rode tandem together. And we had a <laughs> studio apartment in Koreatown. And we could barely pay our rent for the two of us for a studio apartment. Oh, my gosh. And we did that for a year and a half. And we lived in the ghettos of Koreatown. We were part of a robbery in a Food for Less that was like three blocks from our house. This was like, I don't know, maybe our third month in Los Angeles. And we're like, wow, Los Angeles is a crazy place. We were what we could afford, which was the lowest rent we found in Los Angeles. So our whole building was infested by cockroaches. We would constantly have a rotation where they would offer free fumigation once a month, but all the cockroaches would leave your apartment and go to the neighbor's apartment. So when my neighbor was getting fumigated, I would have like five times more cockroaches. Like you flip the lights and you see hundreds. Like it's like the nightmare scenario. But we knew this going in when I, when I was moving to Los Angeles, I knew from the start that we were going to struggle and then it was going to be hard. You know, we, my brother and I signed a five-year contract. We're like for five years, we will stay no matter what. And after five years, we'll renegotiate our contract and see what we're going to do. The first year actually wasn't so bad because the universe was kind of lining things. And, you know, I had a gymnastics job and the circus thing and everything was like lining up. The second year was the hardest year for me because that was really where the struggling hit, where you understood like, oh, this is rough and this is going to be rough for a while. As I was training circus, uh, I met a performer at Cirque du Soleil in, in Iris. His name's Robert Weber. He, he was telling me about this circus school, EMC, in uh, Montreal. And it's one of the best circus schools in the world. And he was like, hey, if you're serious about becoming a performer, you should audition for this school. You know, this is like the, the authentic, true, best in the world circus artists come out of this school. So I ended up flying to, to Montreal in February and auditioning for the school. And I met this Russian grandmaster, a uh, circus grandmaster. He's like third, fourth generation circus. His father invented a discipline called Russian Cradle. And he, he teaches that discipline. He was so stoked that I spoke Russian. And I spoke Russian at like a first grade level, but he's in Montreal. Montreal with a thick Russian accent speaking French and English. And I could not understand his English. I had no idea how anyone else could understand his English. But I understood enough Russian that he would talk to me in Russian. He's, a, he's like a big clown. He, he likes to play practical jokes on people. So he ended up getting me in trouble like three times during the audition. You know, but he's a person of power, pepperoni and all these circus artists. And he's like, hey, you see that mat? Your homework to prove to me that you're a dedicated circus artist, you have to climb on top of this mat without falling off or making some noise. So then I climb up, you know, I'm like, okay, I'm climbing up and he's laughing as I'm struggling. And then I fall off and I make a lot of noise and the headmistress comes in and yells at all of us doing an audition you can't make noise and goof around and i'm like and i look at him and he's just like <laughs> um so when we were going through the training halfway through is now a lot of the coaches are russian and i don't know if they knew that i understood russian and they were screening us they were really really blunt about how i wasn't made for circus they're like his core is weak his body's twisted he's got good flexibility but he has no strength i don't really see a lot of potential in him and he vouched for me and he was like no he's got potential i could train him you know he'll be a good student He'll be great for Russian Cradle. He's got a good size. He's got a good build. You can see that he's got drive. You have to understand that people at this audition are the best in the world. I mean, I saw this guy from Colombia who was phenomenal. I've never seen someone so good on straps, tumbling, everything. He could do everything. He got cut on the first day. I was good, but I wasn't as good as some of the other people. There's yeah, a lot yeah. of talented people. I mean, even in LA, there's a lot of beautiful people. A lot of people who can do a lot of things, but then they're still doing their thing. Not really progressing. Yeah, yeah. Based on their abilities in that moment, they have a maximum potential. Some people who are talented have a higher maximum potential threshold, but they never achieve it because they've never had to work hard for their talent. The people who are naturally talented. Yeah. So even though their threshold, like they might have the potential of ending up here, they stay here because they were good in here. Now there's people who have a lower threshold, but you could change it through training. It's just very, very hard. When you came on set, you were stretching for like two hours or something. It was insane. Yeah. Yeah, I was doing a contortion challenge then, and I was trying to become a contortionist. It's it's something that I've been doing called what I call impossible challenges. You have a challenge that you know is impossible from the start. There's no physical way to achieve this challenge, mm. but you approach it as if it's possible. An impossible task requires impossible effort. So if you know going in that the task is impossible, you throw everything you have at it. A lot of these happen with stupid bets. I lose every bet that I make because the task is impossible, but the bet is what holds me accountable to stick with the training. So then a year later, or however long 
the challenges, they'll be like, see, you didn't make it. I'll be like, see, but I tried. So I, I made a bet that I could become a contortionist in one year. I did not succeed this belt bet because I'm still not a contortionist. And that was like four years ago or three years ago. But then I trained every free second for a year. And in that year, I surpassed the level of flexibility I would have never achieved if I hadn't hit it that hard. Mm -hmm. But I didn't become a contortionist. And at the very end, you end up in this very manic frenzy. It's like the last couple of days. You already know that you failed. You're already burnt out because it's been a year. You're super tired and you don't want to do it anymore. Where the only way you'll achieve this task is by divine intervention. And for me, for that that challenge I pushed through right up to midnight I stretched right up to midnight and at 1201 I just collapsed and I was like okay that was a year and that's really where you, you build that that grit within you that no matter what you will push through even if it's impossible even if, if everything's stacked against you you will still do it it's more about inner fortitude than actual achieving something uh, actually one of my most recent impossible challenges was actually the Darth Vader character so I approached it with the same intensity as I do with all my other impossible challenges when I first got cast my first two weeks I froze I got the par I was auditioning, you know, so I was in the mindset, yes, I'm going to play this character. I played it before. And then I got it. And then I understood what I had got was that I got to play this iconic character. And if I don't play it the best possible way, I'll either be revered or I'll be crucified. And I will know instantly. <laughs> and I absolutely froze. And I was like, oh man, I don't know where to start. I started looking at the lore and there was so much lore. And I was just like, this is overwhelming. And then I, I met with a close friend of mine who is a, a serious, serious Star Wars fan. And he's one of the few people that I had told about the role. And it was, he kind of acted as a consultant of like, which direction should I approach this with? We're talking. And he's like, I'm not going to give you any advice. He's like, this is your own journey. You have to approach your journey and find your character yourself. He's like, I'm not going to help you. I don't want to influence you in any way because then I'll contaminate the end result of the character. Good He's time. like, but what I will tell you is my experience as a child watching this. When I was a kid, I was 13 when I watched the first movie. He said it was revolutionary because there wasn't anything like this in existence. And he's like, and it was the first time approaching something that had one mysticism when culturally at the time, everything was very conservative. And mysticism transcended every religion, but kind of touched on everything religion at the same time it was a common tale of good versus evil light versus dark and anyone from any religion from any background could look behind them and be like okay good must win evil must lose you know it's very clear so that was the first aspect of it and the second aspect was space adventure the, the way they shot things were revolutionary at that time and he was just explaining this experience that it was so new that it, it was the the most revolutionary thing and he became hooked right and when he explained that to me i was like oh okay this is what i'm trying to get this is the feeling that i'm trying to achieve is understanding that I'm not trying to play Darth Vader. I'm trying to be the worst villain in, in history. And that changed it for me because I didn't want to play a stereotype of the character because it's been done in every fan film and everything else. You already know the gestures that he uses. You already know the moves. And I didn't want to be a stereotype. I don't want to be a character of this character. Once I got that little piece of advice, I understood what I really needed to understand mentally was how to be a tyrant and how to be a conqueror. That's essentially who Darth Vader is. And then also I had to understand who Anakin Skywalker was before the transition. And from there, I started just feeding everything I could find historically about every conqueror and tyrant. I study a lot of them. I have memory loss from concussion, so I don't remember my prep work. So there's a lot of Roman emperors and rulers who are terrible. There's this one who was specifically terrible. So you have to understand because they had such a level of resolve and also hmm. they had such a hierarchy that they knew that they were above everyone else. And everyone else was just ants and they could do whatever they want because it didn't matter because they were the ruler of Rome. You know, while you're thinking about that, I mean, I definitely want to highlight because I remember on our film, there's a lot of dialogue, actually, your character gives. I actually wasn't expecting you to know all the dialogue, but you did. And it was delivered in the way as it should. You're wearing this this suit, but it's like there's all this body language that comes along with it and just the, the presence and the movement. It was it was beautiful. I, so you totally blew my exp expectations out of the water. Thank and you. then you were just going. I was like, oh, wow, this guy is, is really good. Just talking about it makes me want to cry kind of thing. That's what we're talking about now is the level. Because I think talking about the Darth Vader thing, because I was researching about what you did, and I want to hear more about what, what you did. But essentially, it seems to me that you're really playing Darth Vader. I mean, yes, there are three characters. Uh, but basically, we work together. There's three of us. And each of us, we did everything we can to bring the best character forward. And my specialty was the physical performance in the suit. I'm a suit actor. So my job as a suit actor was to understand who the character was so that I could bring the character 
to life, which means that under the mask, I'm feeling all the emotions. And the crazy thing was because I approached so hard with this character, um, I did five months of prep. And part of my prep was like meditating into rage. I mean, I did a lot of really crazy things. And the walking was so important because that's specifically what Deborah Chow asked me. It was my first homework assignment. It was a very specific walk that she wanted. Yeah. And in focus, you know that you practice something until you could do it hung over. I've seen a lot of really cr amazing, talented Russian acrobats who are also alcoholics. And it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen because there's things that I can't do sober. They go up there and they do the most mind blowing thing. And you're like, wow, how? And the how is the training. It's muscle memory. And that was what I had to achieve to really be this character. It was not to play the character, but to be the character. Part of my, my prep was I would chain smoke cigars. First of all, don't do this. It's bad. <laughs> Specifically to agitate my lungs and run like hot steam through my myself just to visualize what it would be in a box of tank. So I'd have the nebulizer and I would sit there and I could feel my lungs burn and I could feel the hot air cycling through and that was the relief. And then I'd meditate in that in that space to understand what it means to lose everything. You know, Anakin, he was a super soldier. He's doing flips. He's an acrobat and I'm an acrobat. So I understand that aspect. He also was a prodigy and a genius. I understand that because I have, I've trained with a lot of masters in different disciplines. So I have, I have a high technical understanding of technique and movement and things like that. So there's a lot of parallels that I saw with Anakin and myself. And I asked myself, what would it feel like to be a prodigy, to be good at everything, to, to flip, to just move with complete freedom and then to lose everything, you know? And that's really what I had to understand was the transformation of being in the suit. And he was frustrated because he was such a prodigy and everyone else was downplaying how good it was to not inflate his ego. I had a knee injury earlier on in my career that put me out for like five years. And I, was, I used a meditation technique as, as well as stretching to help recover my knee. And it wasn't supposed supposed to be possible. At that time, I was at my lowest point in life and really there was no reason to live. I had lost my movement. I went through a big breakup. I lost my career. Yeah. yeah. It's and it's I really you can't move. Yeah. yeah and that's you your, that's your livelihood and you can't move. It's my identity. It's who I am. I'm an yeah. acrobat. What good is a broken acrobat? I just tell stories about how good I used to be. When I understood that that's what Anakin went through, it's, but also he had a, a deeper level because in Anakin's mind, he's right. You have to understand that he's not the villain. He's the hero. That's, yeah. that's yeah. the mentality because the universe is so chaotic because of all these factions and all these these religions and things like that. And my job is to unify the world, like Alexander the Great, is once the, the universe is united under supreme rule, then everyone will be fed. There'll be no more war. There'll be no more fighting. That's the way I, I approach the character. The second drive for me for the character was that if I could get dark enough in the force, I could resurrect Padme. Padme is the only person that I've ever loved, right? Not only that, but, but I was a slave and she was a queen. And even though she was a queen, she chose to go against the norm and to be with me, right? So you have to understand a love much deeper than love this is devotion this is everything mm -hmm. and then to lose that that is my only pull the darker i become the more powerful i become and then i could learn how to resurrect her and then we could be together the pain comes from losing everything in my mind in my character's mind i'm blaming the jedi for everything it's like when you see a billionaire and you see starvation and you're like well you could help them you have all the money you want you know it's that same kind of feeling like you mm -hmm. are all powerful you're a jedi council you have magic powers why haven't you done anything i'm gonna do it because no one else is doing it and i'm so strong that no one's going to stop me it's such a drive where it's almost altruistic i'm doing this for the greater good I that's, love that's that. the way, yeah that's the way i played the character because the layers i mean you have so many layers isn't it did you study acting too and alongside the, um, is that what you came to la for to become an um, actor I, did, I mostly i never got around to studying acting i only took a couple acting classes and most of my stuff was in movement and, and I trained a lot in clown and physical theater. Mm -hmm. So as I was transitioning to, to suit acting, I knew that the, the most important thing for me was physicality. And it was also my strength. So I focused specifically on the movement, understanding how to portray emotion through movement. And also because as I was struggling, I couldn't afford acting classes. But I read acting books. And what I understood from the books was that you really have to take the prep to a level where you become the character. So it sounds like you did do your own studying and, and training oh, in a different yeah, way. A Whatever money you got, it, it went to the craft. Genetically, you're a big guy. So is it like naturally people think that of you that maybe you'll have some sort of movement, but not really think of you in the acting sense? You've seen me enough and experienced me enough to understand that like my whole drive is self-improvement and I always want to be better. I never want to be stagnant. So it was, okay, I'm good at this. Now I'm going to focus on this next thing. I'm going to focus on this next thing. So there was a point where I sat down and I was injured for a while. So I had five years to study acting. I shot my own scenes. I would go over a dialogue. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite books was Stella Adler's book. I forgot the name of it, but I really liked Stella Adler's approach. The 
blend between method and conventional acting. She was like, you don't have to, to tap into your most traumatic experience over and over again to do a crying scene. What you have to do is you have to develop your imagination. You develop your imagination through study, deep character work. So she would make points like if you are a soldier, even if you're a B soldier in a scene holding a spear, you have to understand the type of spear you're using, what kind of combat you would do with the spear, you know? So it's like mm -hmm. this deep level of character prep. And this is for a B character who's in the background holding the spear. The, the common actor would just be like, okay, I'm holding a stick, easy. And Stella's approach was, no, you have to understand what you're doing. The more you could use your imagination to tap into and pull this character into existence, because you need this context. You can't just be, I am angry now. You have to understand there's more layers to anger. You could be angry because you feel betrayal, but you could also feel love at the same time. And it could be a complex emotion. I mean, even the ones that don't have it all flushed out are the trickiest because it could be anything. And then to give them something unique that's noticeable, that's all like, oh, ah, that was ah, that guy. Yeah, that's an art. Wait, can you tell me what happened before the age of 23? So you arrive in LA at 23, but what was going on all before that? Well, like I had a janitorial business at 18. What? I was a janitor in Spokane, Washington. I The Stray okay. Cleaning LLC. And I cleaned the Michaels and I cleaned the Dollar Trees and I cleaned the Les Schwab. And I had a small team of people who worked with me and I was doing this as a profession, but I had my entire day absolutely Absolutely free. In the early, early morning, I was cleaning the uh, store before it was open. And in the evening when the store closed, I would clean the store. So I would mostly be up at night and then I'd, I'd go to sleep and I'd wake up like at two or three. In the summer, my younger brother taught me how to do a really terrible backflip off of a dock into the water. He's like, just jump really hard and throw your head back as hard as you can and your body will flip. And I, I didn't complete the rotation, but in my mind I did because it's water. So it feels like you landed it, you know? So, and then I was so stoked because I never in my mind thought that I could ever do a backflip. And yeah. I got this, this energetic high of like, I could do anything. Anything. But I was embarrassed because I was really shy to do it in front of people and I had no training. So I walked in and I was like, can I rent the gym and just like practice by myself mm. during the day when there's no classes? And I talked to the receptionist, her name was Molly. And she's like, we actually don't do that, but you could leave your contact information. So I left my contact information and I left. And then I got a phone call getting a job offer to teach the gymnastics boys team because the owner of the gym owns a few gyms and he overheard my conversation. And he said, what was his name? Demetrius Pistrevsky. He's like, it's a Russian name. He, he's definitely a Russian gymnast. And I was like, no, no, I don't know anything. I was like, I, I came here to learn. I was like, I, I just wanted to rent it because I'm kind of embarrassed to train in an adult class because I'm kind of awkward and not in my body. And they're like, well, if you're still interested, we're having like an open interview to work with kids, if that'd be something they'd be interested in. And I had I had this big gap during my day and I didn't know what to do with it. And I was just kind of looking for something to do. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll give it a shot, why not? So I came in for the interview and we worked with like very young kids, preschoolers and, and level one to like five, six years old. We played games and we taught some stuff and I had so much fun, I had such a blast. And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, I'll do this. So then they hired me as a coach. So I had my janitorial business and then during the day I would teach gymnastics recreationally. And I, and I would shadow a coach for a year and they trained me. And the more I learned, the more I got teaching responsibilities. So eventually I was teaching one, two, and then I was teaching three, four, and I was teaching pre-team. And then I started feeling like a hypocrite because I started teaching my own classes. Yeah, I have to at least know the basics in my body. Yeah. I knew the information and then I was just translating the information into my body. So then I would film myself and train every night. And then halfway through, I realized that I like gymnastics more mm -hmm. than I like janitorial. And most people might be like, oh, I can't do that. I can't be a janitor. I can't clean people's stuff or you get the mentality and attitude your parents maybe or your parents? I mean, you might understand this a, a big portion is what i call third world grit or like immigrant grit i'm russian ukrainian and i moved to, to america when i was one so my parents are immigrants and we had that immigrant drive that whatever you do be the best and also we knew as immigrants, and you may have experienced this too, that sometimes the game is rigged against you. So you're always playing a losing hand. You don't have the, the luxury. You're not rich enough to be depressed and be in your head and be in your feelings. You get up and you go. And that's kind of what the drive was. I was a damn good janitor. I still am. Yeah. Uh, life, life, life is about cleaning up after people's shit all the time. I got to tell you, you take a lot of it from, from people too. I mean, in yeah. different forms. Like you have this pride and pride in what you do. You, you come out of it and you're like, okay, that was my best and the best changes all the time so my best from five years ago is different than my best today so that was part of it and that's actually what i used for the character was understanding that anakin also had this third world grit because he was a slave and that journey is what gave him the upper hand not just being a prodigy was that he worked harder than everyone else because he knew what it felt to have nothing and he knew what kind of privilege it was to not be a slave okay one of the questions i wanted to ask you because just start from nothing when i saw this on facebook i was like holy shit like that that must be the like the holy grail. You train in the circus, started with your own business. You you did it. It's the American dream. 
that's what it is. Anything is possible in America. You know, a lot of the times it's stacked against you, but it's possible. And that's the main thing. The, if the possibility exists and there's a way to get there. So yeah, it was full circle. I, I found out about the role a year and a half ago. I went through a really hard journey recovering from the role because I went so far into the character that halfway through filming, I started channeling the character. I stopped acting completely and I was channeling. And then I felt every emotion the character felt. I realized that humans aren't meant to experience that much pain at once. And I got to feel what it feels like to be Darth Vader and it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't a pleasant place to be. I couldn't shake the character for like three months. Because of all my training and prep and the meditation practice, I have self-control. So I could hold mm -hmm. it in, but I could feel the storm inside of me. Oh, you're an ultra nice guy too. But I mean, doing that for a year and a half, I mean, it does change you. Oh, it changed you a lot. Yeah, I didn't realize. When I couldn't shake the character, I went on this whole spirit journey. And part of it was leaving Easter eggs, knowing I had just played this character. I will have these interactions with people. And then later on, they're going to be like, oh my God, that was Darth Vader, mm -hmm. right? So that was fun. So yeah. I went, and part of it was also getting me in the right headspace. I had to be happy again. Maybe yeah. it was my first time playing a character for so long and staying in the headspace for so long. You know? Yeah, tell me about these grueling training sessions. Part of it was uh, three hours a day I would walk. It was very, very important for me. So it became a meditative practice. I trained sword three hours a day as well. I was coming from a knee injury, but I really wanted to, to learn sword because it's so important for the character. When they told me I couldn't train sword because of a fast pivot, my knee is still, was still unstable at the time to do these kind of fast movements. So then when, when I couldn't train sword, I was like, well, I still have to, it's part of my character development to be good with sword. Not just good at sword, this is a sword master, is that when I hold a sword in my hand, it looks like it belongs in my hand. I would just go to the gym and I would swing the sword and I would train about an hour and a half at the gym and then I'd go home and train again for an hour and a half. And then I trained with two swords specifically because Anakin was ambidextrous. So in, in episode three, you see him fight with two swords. Hayden Christensen is actually left-handed and he learned how to fight with his right hand for the movie. So that's the amount of prep he did to play the character and to fight. So I thought that was poetic and I'm right-handed. So I was like, I will teach my left hand. And then I had my character development, my research where I'd spend about an hour and a half, two hours a day researching time to understand Caligula. Caligula. That's that's the the name that I was trying to remember. I actually think I saw one of those like documentaries like on History Channel about Caligula. Super fast. Yeah. yeah. So he was one of the best the best emperors of the time. And then he got really sick. And all of his councilmen and, and they all prostrated and made a big scene. You know how it is. Like, oh God, please take me instead. And then he got better. And then he said, "You promised the God that you're going to trade your life for mine. I am alive, which means you have to keep your promise." And then he killed them all. And when he came back, his mind switched. He had his near-death experience and he became a very cruel, cruel, cruel tyrant. For me, it was like, if this is the worst villain in human history, history of the whole universe, this is the worst of the worst. He's worse than Caligula. So two hours a day was studying history. Part of it was doing the chain smoking, the cigars and the meditation. And then another part from there was studying the lore. And there's a lot of it. There's a lot to study. And that was 10 hours a day every day. When you're in the suit and, and performing, what was that like? I do a lot of suit acting. I'm going to be first to say it was probably the hardest suit I've ever worn. Harder than the chainmail that we wore. Like in the lore, the suit is intentionally uncomfortable to keep Darth Vader present and in the moment. The pain is what gives him strength and gives him power to the dark side. So in the lore, his helmet actually has needles that go into his head. I'll just carry how it with heavy, How heavy was the suit, though? Like, I, mean... I, I don't remember. It was maybe 30 to 50 pounds, maybe. Yeah. And then I had a really amazing suit team consisting of four people. In between every take, they would run air through the helmet so my eyes wouldn't fog up. It's like, you know, it's, everything's fogged over and I'm just walking with confidence, hoping I don't walk into a wall or <laughs> something. So like you're holding the posture, you can't break character, you can't look at the floor, you can't scan. You're just holding the posture and you walk with trust, knowing that someone's going to say something if you're about to fall off an edge. It helped find the character deeper because it was true to the suit. It was very uncomfortable suit and it took a lot out of you to wear and it took a lot of your movement and understanding how well I move and then how well I can't move in the suit and how Anakin must have felt moving 10 times better than I move and moving even worse in the suit, you know, because his suit is made out of obsidian and it blocks off all, all force powers. When you were working, were you like, don't mess up, don't mess up? Like, were you feeling that way? Or really, like I was really past that. I was like that in the beginning when I was freaking out. And the first day I got onto set, we yeah. shot the street scene, first scene introduction with filming. And that was a very magical experience because everyone was excited because I had been pulled away from the cast. I was away from the cast. I was away from the stunt team. I was just training with my movement coach solo for so much time. It's a secret basically, right? That you're, that Darth Vader's going to come back? 
and it was it was cool like I, like honestly filming was a dream this is crazy when i left uh spokane washington i told my friends because i was really obsessed with ninjas and i was obsessed with darth vader so i told them if there ever was a darth vader i'm gonna play him so then when rogue one happened i was like oh shoot that was my chance to play darth vader and i didn't i didn't make it i believe it was october last year two years ago that they were casting for this character it was super vague and it was super nda but you know how industry people still kind of speak a little bit in hushed secret tones of like this is a role that's coming up it's going to be a suit actor it's going to fight with a sword big character star wars I mean, you've heard of the law of attraction and just kind of like manifesting what you want, you know? So for me, it was like, I heard this character and I'm like, well, the, the, what I could do right now in my power is I could just train as if I'm going to do this character. I played the character before in a web short with my friend, Bill Parker. It's called Jedi with the GoPro 2. You should check it out. It's really cool. I already been doing a month of prep for it. And then I get called randomly from the stunt coordinator. And then I had a couple auditions and I booked it in January. But I'd already started training for it in October without even knowing that I was going to be called for it. Tell me about this thing. Remember, you talked about the cards and you're like, oh, it's fate. What's your philosophy on that? It's probably close to the idea of the force. I see the universe as poetry. And if you pay attention to the things around you, the signs, everything else, you're always driven towards your highest path if you're willing to grow. I'll go back to my original story. So I auditioned for ENC. The coach who really liked me, Alexander Arnatov, the, the circus master, he was like, I need you to practice this and this and this and i did not practice them to the level that i should have not 10 hours a day which is what i should have approached it at right and when and then i got a call that i got accepted in the school the one-year preparatory program it's called mise annual and i was like oh shit i got the school so then for like three weeks or like a month and a half i went super hard to prep for it and then i got there and he's like did you do all the stuff i told you to do i was like well i did this but i didn't do this and this and he's like why didn't you do the things i told you to do and then i didn't get in the school because of bureaucracy and because of paperwork i it was a whole like thing where i got my visa uh, in LA, but it didn't arrive my address in time. So they mailed it to Canada, but I arrived first. So I checked in as a, as a visitor instead of a student. So I was in Canada. I had already sold all my stuff, forfeited my apartment with my brother. So he got a new roommate. And, I, and once again, I only came with like enough money to survive for two months, even though I was supposed to be there for a year. I was like, I'll figure it out when I get there. And then I don't get into school and I'm stuck in Canada. I need to be in Canada. I just don't know why. And I trained with some of the circus kids in the park who were in the school, but the school hadn't started yet. That grandmaster, found out that I wasn't in the school and he contacted me. He got my number from somebody and he said, I will train you outside of the school, oh. kind of like Anakin Skywalker. So he trained me in the morning and in the evening and I would meet with him at lunch and he would teach me philosophy. And all of this was in Russian. So he taught me about yin and yang and duality. He was very influenced in Eastern philosophy. And then he convinced me to audition for Cirque du Soleil. I ended up getting into their preparatory program for athletes. And then, and that's why I was in Canada. And at the time when I, when I got that job, I had maybe like $15 left. I was just like trusted completely in faith. When I got to that program, I was instantly got room and board in their uh, dormitory, which is across the street from Cirque du Soleil. And then they started paying me a training stipend. I trained there for the program. I don't remember how long I trained. I think I trained three months. And then mm -hmm. they flew me back to LA. So I came with a one-way ticket to Canada with like... Gosh. with like a thousand dollars and they flew me back to LA and I had made more money in my training and came back with more value and a deeper understanding of both Cirque du Soleil and circus and this experience of training with a, with a circus grandmaster. And so afterwards, I didn't understand what he had given me for, it took me a few years for it to click to really understand the gift that he gave me because I changed as a person with my experience training with him. And he was the one who kind of taught me to be more observant to the universe and these signs that you see around us. Once it clicked and I understood what he gave me, I realized I would never be able to repay him. He's like a father to me. He's like the most influential person in my life. Because I was outside of the school, he was free to teach me philosophy and his own like mystic approach to life because it wasn't regulated by a school. It was just like, you could train if you want, you don't have to. And he was just super stoked to have someone to speak Russian to. And then later on, I realized the only way I'll repay him is if I surpass him. That is the role of a student is to surpass the teacher. And because he's an actual master, I, I wanted to become a master myself. Because one day I will surpass him so that I could look him in the eyes and could say, thank you for this is the monster that you've created. And everything I am is thanks to him. So I had a lot of very powerful, strong women in my life who shaped me. So I really learned strength, resilience. I learned it from women. I learned it from my mom. I learned it from my sister. I learned it from Stephanie Abrams, who ran a circus school. I've always been surrounded by powerful women, but also in reverse, I've also been surrounded by very weak men. So I had the, the experience of strong women and weak men. And he taught me how to be a gentle, compassionate person and still be strong. I learned kindness and gentleness from a man. And I learned ruthlessness and resilience and strength from women. I think one of the things that stuck out for me was you saying to your friends, I'll see you when I'm Darth Vader. And it seems like along the way, there were these people that believed in you, who took time out of their day, saw the potential. 
and put their faith in you. No man is an island. It's hard to be, even in these characters, like this character is a very isolated character. And part of my character development was also pulling myself away from everyone and living in this isolation. And I was in such a turbulent mental space during this whole experience that I accidentally blew up on my housemates. I accidentally blew up on a homeless person because I was meditating to rage every day. I was always constantly on edge. And then I was learning to be okay with being on edge and not explode. But in that learning process, I exploded. A big portion was I had to pull myself away from people for their own safety and for my own conscience that I wouldn't do something that I would regret, you know? So that was part of the burden of the character. But also on the other hand, you had these people who were cheerleading for me. I knew that I was representing something much bigger than myself, which was the entire fan base. And for some people, this was what they grew up with. There's no way to play Darth Vader without suffering. The, the whole character is based on pain and suffering. As I was going through the, the suffering, I also in the back of my mind could almost energetically feel these people high-fiving me and giving me hugs and being like, hey, it was worth it. In this space, I was meditating so much and I was doing so many manic things that I was almost at the point where I was having force powers. You know, I was having premonitions. I was having a lot of synchronicities. I was I was speaking to the universe. I was as far as you could go into this character headspace so that we could do it right. And it was really important for me that we do it right for this character. And we had one chance to do it right. And, and I wanted to be able to look fans in the face, look my friends in the eyes and be like, I did not hold back at all. Like, this is the best that I could do. And if you don't like it, then you don't like my best. That's what allowed me to, to stop being manic when that anxiety hit me at first was like, I'm just going to approach as hard as I can. This is my new impossible challenge for the year. I'm going to hit it as hard as possible as if it's an impossible challenge. I'm going to approach, I'm going to do everything that I could possibly do. And in the end, whatever happens, happens. But I know in my heart that I did everything. Well, thank goodness for you, because I don't think they expected it, but they got somebody who's very, 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 very passionate about playing this character. And it, it is an important character. So I am so proud of you. I am super proud of you, man. I'm glad we worked together too. I, I, I appreciated your attitude and the person you are, and I enjoyed working with you. So Thank you for that. And thank you for this talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a journey.